Greetings everyone and welcome back to another episode of Plan B Success. We have Joe Stolte today all the way from Los Angeles. Joe is an author, a serial entrepreneur and a business growth coach. But prior to all this, you know, over the last several years of his corporate career, he has actually helped build businesses for his clients and created over a billion dollars in enterprise value. He also had his own digital agency, which he took from scratch. You know, he bootstrapped it, he started it, and then he took it all the way to $500 million before he was able to exit. And then right now he's a CEO of Tractionology Group, under the banner of which he provides all his experience and expertise packaged into coaching programs. So welcome, Joe. Thank you so much, Rajiv. It's good to, good to be here. Absolute pleasure having you. So in your own words, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I was raised in a farm town of less than a thousand people, population of less than a thousand people. And, you know, it's funny because I didn't really know anybody growing up that was successful. I didn't even know anybody that knew anybody that was successful. So I've really been on this mission, you know, for the last 30 years to sort of find success and deconstruct success uh, from a business perspective. And it's really looked like learning and applying and serving and iterating, and then uh, really trying to find the next level for me. So that when you think about me, my, my life has been about that pursuit. It's really just been from a young age. How can I get closer to success, financial success, health success, family success, model the people that have been world-class at it, deconstruct that, and then apply it and kind of find my own path through that. And then of course, in return, turn back and, and help other people uh, and do that in a way that generates value and therefore profit. So let me ask you this, when you actually started your career, when you look back at it, you know, what was the first thing that you did? Um, the very first thing that I did, uh, from a career perspective was interesting. I, you know, like I said, my, my family, we didn't really have a ton of money. We lived in this little farm town, uh, but I got really into hip hop culture in the early nineties. And uh, at that time, what was really cool was to have, you know, Jordan sneakers and a starter Los Angeles Raiders jacket, but both of those items were well over a hundred dollars. And so I was probably nine or 10 and I got bitten by the bug that I needed to have these things to be cool or whatever. And so what I did is I, uh, I started going around and knocking on doors to effectively mow lawns and ask, hey, if I mow your lawn, will you give me 10 bucks? But what happened is I was really bad at mowing lawns and I didn't really enjoy it, but I lived in a farm town. And so there was a ton of migrant workers. So what I did is I went around and I asked all my friends, hey, can I borrow your lawnmower? I got four or five lawnmowers. Then I found a friend that speaks Spanish and I went to a place where all the farm workers were. I was like, hey, will you guys mow these lawns? I've got five lawnmowers, I'll give you five bucks. And so I got them to mow the lawns and I kept half the money. And I just kind of kept that thing going for the summer until I could buy my, my, my sneakers and my jacket. So that was like my first job or my first business that I started, but I didn't think about it like that. All I thought was, well, I really want this thing. How can I make that happen? What would need to be true for that to happen? And I just kind of like worked my way through the process. Um, beyond that though, you know, my, my first career job in business is I started off in management consulting. So I effectively started off helping, you know, Fortune 500 companies, you know, at the intersection of what I'll just call marketing strategy and operations. And, you know, in big, big companies, they have very distinct challenges. Um, and I got to learn a lot about business through that. I got to learn a lot about helping people. I got to learn about what it means to have like a, a client relationship and to really shepherd that. And uh, I was really fortunate uh, along, you know, between my lawn mowing story and getting to management consulting to, to find a mentor that really helped me and woke me up to what was possible in my life. And so, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I got started. That's pretty awesome. That's business 101 with your lawn mowing story right there. So what did you study? You know, uh, what's your academic background? Yeah. So I went to school, I got a undergraduate degree in business and, um, you know, I, I went to school a little bit later. I didn't start school till I was like 23 or 24. I, I pursued a totally separate passion in dance uh, and just skipped college after high school. And uh, but eventually, you know, I met my mentor and he really inspired me around what was possible in my life. And I as part of that inspiration, went back and got my degree. 
And, uh, you know, it was really helpful because, you know, for most of us at a young age, when you're 17, 18 years old, you know, just physiologically, like your prefrontal cortex isn't even fully formed. So like, and that's the part of the brain where, you know, we really understand the implications of our decisions. And so we're kind of asking young adults to go out and make, Hey, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? When they, you know, they don't even have the capacity in some cases to be able to do, to answer that question effectively. I didn't know any of that. I just kind of followed my dreams and, uh, woke up 23 years old and was like, cool, now I want to go to school because I want to, I want to work in business. And so I studied business. Uh, but what I did was I took a really unique approach. So I went to university, I went to the university of Washington and I, uh, I really, I really paid a lot of attention, and, you know, in, in college, they give you these elective credits, you know, and rather than taking the easiest possible class for my elective, what I would do is I would go and take the hardest kind of 400 level class, if you will, in all of the different business disciplines you know there was one for like accounting and marketing and finance and project management and operations so i just tried to take as many 400 level business classes as i could once i got to that level um just for perspective because i i knew that i wanted to go into management consulting and i really wanted this well-rounded perspective um but the but the thing there that i think the takeaway was i knew my outcome before i started college i didn't go in as like Hey, I'm going to kind of figure out what I want to do and with some loose intention. Like I knew I wanted to study business. I knew that I wanted to do that with the end outcome of being competitive so that I could get a job as a management consultant. And that, you know, that was super helpful, just knowing my outcome and working backwards from that. And I don't think I would have been able to do that at like 17 or 18. At 17 or 18, I didn't didn't have enough flaps around the block to understand how to tie my shoes, you know, in the in the bigger picture of life. Um, but yeah, so knowing my outcome really helped drive my experience, if you will, in college. And, you know, before you started your digital agency, how long did you actually work a corporate job? Yeah, I did two years in management consulting uh, and two years in at Microsoft as a full-time employee, but I was sort of an internal consultant there. Uh, and actually, quick, quick correction, I... I started an agency that we built and sold, and then I went and uh, built up a technology company. And that's the one we scaled to the, the $500 million oh, value awesome. mark. Yeah, the agency didn't, didn't reach nearly that uh, much financial success, but it did reach pretty good success where, the, where we were able to sell it you know, within one year really quickly. So tell us about these, you know, your agency, and then what prompted you to go after the technology company? Yeah, you know... Um, there's a space in the middle there that I left out, which is important to know. You know, I, I left Microsoft, I got married and my father passed away from cancer all in like a 60 day period. So I left Seattle and I moved to Los Angeles, California. I moved to Venice beach and I started a, a, a tech company. You know, we raised a little bit of money for it and, you know, it took me all, I had to build up all this courage to, to leave my comfortable corporate job and go pursue my, my newfound passion as an entrepreneur. And, you know, I really thought this is it, you know, we raised money and we were doing all the right things. Um, and this is going to be my chance to really make an impact and really make, you know, a lot of income. And what happened was, you know, that was the, the opposite happened, you know, after a couple of years, uh, we didn't hit the right milestones. We weren't able to raise any further capital and we certainly weren't generating enough revenue to sustain the business. And we had to shut that business down. And I remember very specifically, um, there was a very specific moment where I was actually at Whole Foods in Venice Beach and it was a really hot day. And I had gone there, um, this is right after I kind of like signed the papers to like dissolve the company basically. And it was a really hot day. So I was like, hey, I'm gonna go get something to eat and get a cold drink. Well, I went back, I grabbed the ice cold drink. I, you know, I got the food at the hot bar. You know, it's not like something you can put back on the shelf. And I got to the register and I pull out my credit card and it declined. And uh, that was like a really low moment in my entrepreneurial experience. You know, I uh, juxtaposed that to the dream that I had that I thought that I would achieve when I left Microsoft. You know, it was a really low moment for me. Um, but that's really the genesis of what happened next is rather than sitting around and sulking over my loss and my moment in this kind of extreme mo moment of embarrassment at Whole Foods, what I did as I went back and started to think, well, what, what can I learn from this failure? And fortunately for me, I was living in a, in a house with a roommate that was very sharp entrepreneur. And we went out to eat uh, in Santa Monica. We were grabbing burgers and uh, we just kind of came up with this idea. You know, it was like at the time, this was around 2014, 2015, 
a lot of um, a lot of people, a lot of people's parents were coming onto Facebook, and a lot of younger people were going to like Snapchat and other social media platforms. So we were like, "What is everyone?" You know, then, then all these other social media marketers were like, "Well, let's go teach people how to do Snapchat." And I was like, "Well, think about all the new demographics that are coming onto Facebook. You know, these are people 40, 50, 60 years old that have small businesses. They don't know anything about marketing on so online. And for Facebook, why don't we help them?" And that's how we kind of came up with the idea. And, uh, you know, for that one, we didn't raise any money. We didn't raise any money at all. We just went out and said, how can we validate the idea and validate the message into the marketplace before we, we raise a dollar or do anything else? And, and that really was the genesis of the agency. That's pretty awesome. So, you know, when you look back at your, your own career, you identify, you know, a really low point, you know, and how you came out of it. Yeah, I would have to say that 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 moment in Whole Foods was probably the lowest. That, that was my low point. You know, it was embarrassing for me. You know, like I, I spent all this time really wrapping my head around what I wanted to do in, in, in the consulting world as in college. And I got my dream job and then I, you know, left and got to work with my dream client. But then I woke up one day and realized, well, I'm I'm actually an entrepreneur, you know, and I really need to go pursue that. And for the first two years, it was really great because uh, we, it was really fun being an entrepreneur and it was really validating and I was learning a lot. Um, but, but it was very humbling uh, having to dissolve the business. It was very humbling uh, having to tell the people closest to me and the investors that we raised money from that, that we had to, you know, the show was over basically. And it was very humbling to go to Whole Foods and have my credit card be declined where I couldn't even buy food, you know, while my wife is out, you know, working her job and more or less supporting both of us you know, and that's fine. But for me, that was a, from an ego, from a spirit perspective, it was just very crushing. Um, I remember walking back from Whole Foods and just thinking that there's, that I've, there's got to be a reason why this is happening to me. There's got to be a, a purpose around why this ex is experiences in my life. And so that just that idea that there, this is happening for a reason gave me the, the mental room to shift and go okay well what's the reason what am i what's the lesson i'm supposed to be learning here and what am i going to do about it and so it was really that idea of trying to find the meaning and then going out and applying it that allowed me to make the shift from what could have been devastating what could have been you know a moment that would have taken someone out of the game and never had them try entrepreneurship again and it really allowed me to go okay this was valuable because it wasn't just this terrible thing that happened to me it's actually a blessing i got this baptism by fire and all the wrong things to do as an entrepreneur. So now let me go turn around and do the right things and, uh, and really finding the courage to take the next step and go and do that versus, you know, giving up, which so many of us do. So your technology company, the one that you actually scaled, you know, how long was the period of scaling and uh, walk us through that story? Yeah. So actually, after we sold the agency, uh, my business partner went and became the head of growth of this company. Uh, I, so we didn't found it. Uh, I actually made, I was an investor. I invested in the company and I, I was, I was asked to join on as a number two role, kind of the chief operating officer. And uh, you know, I came in, we were probably seven or eight employees, a little bit of validation. The company had uh, was just wrapping up coming out of an accelerator program in Silicon Valley called 500 startups. And um, you know, we, we were really kind of poised to, take the product to market and scale. And that's when I showed up. And, uh, you know, over the next uh, two and a half or three years, we scaled the company to over 70 employees, you know, a half billion dollar valuation. Um, you know, we raised, you know, well over 50 or $60 million to support the growth of the company. And by the way, the company I mentioned before is a uh, lottery.com, you know, so we were working in a heavy, heavily regulated industry uh, which is very challenging. It's not just like going into any other industry. You know, we had to learn how to lobby and hire lobbyists and, um, you know, change legislation at the state level in order to clarify our business model so that we would be legal. Um, I mean, there's a lot of like new territory to cover as an entrepreneur and, and in terms of the market. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really exciting because one thing that we did really well was we put a great process in place to attract the best talent to the best possible talent that we could get our hands on. And, uh, you know, it was like working with a team of, I don't want to say geniuses, but working with a team of very, very sharp people around you all the time and really kind of pushing you to the next level. And uh, I never got that in my last, I had that in the agency with my business partner, but we didn't really have that in my first startup. 
um, you know, at that scale, 70 employees, a lot of really good talent. And so my big takeaway there was like, the people really, really, really are important when it comes to scaling. Like, yes, systems, yes, process, yes, KPIs, yes, get product market fit. Uh, of course, get your message market fit and get the revenue in the door. But at a certain point, it really just becomes about the quality of the people that you surround yourself with. Um, and that's where like one plus one starts to equal 11, you know, and not two. And uh, what was, how did you guys exit? Um, you know, I actually vested my, um, my equity in the company and ended up my son. I had a, a son a few years back and at that time decided to leave the company. Um, and then more recently, uh, you know, after I left, uh, our head of product took over as the kind of the, the business effectively replaced me and then some, and, uh, work with the founders to really scale it up. And, uh, this calendar year, uh, lottery.com was acquired, uh, as part of a, a SPAC, a publicly traded company, uh, you know, for, I think it was something like $536 million or something like that. Awesome. Yeah. So when did you form, uh, the Tractionology group? Yeah. So shortly after a uh, lottery, you know, I had my son and uh, that was a big life changing moment. And uh, I did a lot of soul searching and I thought to myself, well, what's the next thing for me? And I really started observing the marketplace and seeing that a lot of these service based businesses, you know, coaches, consultants, online experts, attorneys, insurance agents, you know, wealth managers, they have, they were really kind of operating under what I'll just call like the business growth playbook 1.0. It was kind of the old world. It was the pre-internet world. It was the world of, you know, if you build it, they will come. And if you just prospect and do more cold calls and, you know, you know get in touch with more people, then you, you, you'll you eventually make money. And what I learned from the technology world was there's all this really advanced thinking around getting specific on your target market and systematically testing your message until it converts and then making sure that after it converts, you know, you're turning one client into three or four through the way that you do good work after the sale. And I was like, wow, that this isn't really happening in the service-based business world. Uh, certainly not at scale. I mean, some people have figured it out and I thought, well, I would love to help that world. And so that was kind of the genesis of the Tractionology Group was how do we help uh, service-based business owners get more and better clients? And, uh, you know, that was the journey that we started uh, back in 2019. And, you know, and since then, we've been incredibly fortunate to work with, you know, really great service-based business owners ac across the world, actually, and really help them scale their business, you know, to that $100,000 per month mark and, and in far greater in some cases. Awesome. And then talk a little bit about your book, Tractionology. Yeah. So the book Tractionology, you know, and the subtitle is called Want More and Better Clients. Read this book. Uh, it, it's really a distillation of our exact formula. So how do we take a business uh, that has got, got a little bit of revenue in the door, uh, service-based business, and how do we really step-by-step step scale up that business so that it's consistently and predictably generating revenue at the $100,000 per mark or greater uh, per month? And, um, you know, the book really walks through our formula and uh, the formula starts with having the right set of belief systems and the right mindset. So I walk through uh, five, you know, really, really powerful mindsets that you need in order to embark upon this journey. And, and then we take you through our formula uh, that the framework we have is a four step formula. It's an acronym PACT, P-A-C-T. So what the first is that we package, we help you attract clients, we help you convert them. And then we help you transform them into raving fans who will, you know, buy more, stay longer and refer more people to you. Awesome. And where do people find this book? Uh, tractionologybook.com is where you can find it. Uh, also, if you Google the word tractionology, uh, then that will very quickly bring you to the book page. Is it also available on Amazon and such? That's right. It is also available on Amazon as well. Um, you know, Amazon is kind of the retail price. Uh, and if you go to tractionologybook.com, uh, all you have to do is just pay for shipping and we'll, we'll actually mail you the book for free. Um, you know, and there's some other options on that page. You know, we have some exclusive training programs that we only offer when you buy the book at tractionologybook.com. Uh, it's also the only place that you can get the audio book as well. Uh, but if you love uh, Kindle or you want to read it on, you know, you want to buy it on Amazon through your Amazon account. Absolutely. You can also get it on Amazon as well. That's great. So what are all the other programs that you have under the Tractionology group? Yeah, you know, our, our main program is a 90 day accelerator program, you know, it's a one on one 
you know, we, we effectively do the work with you. So, you know, it's not like you're, you're just watching a course and you're kind of doing it on your own, right? Like that's, um, that's, that's cool and that's good and that's helpful. Uh, but what we've really tried to set up is uh, I tried to model what I saw in Silicon Valley. You know, you see these big accelerators, you know, like Y Combinator and 500 startups where they take young entrepreneurs that really don't know too much about scaling and they really run them through a, re a regimented program to help them really sprint hard and scale up quickly. Well, I wanted to replicate that for service-based businesses. And so, you know, it's one-on-one. -on -one. We meet every other week. And uh, we create a custom roadmap specifically for your business, for your service-based business. And then every other week we get on, you get some homework, you might watch some videos, but you're really working and implementing and getting data back from the market. And then we review that and then we get to the next step. Um, you know, So unlike watching a course, there's really nowhere to hide. It's for people that want the accountability, that are ready to put the work in and also want the support, right? Because you know when you're just watching a course or video, um, there's so much internal resistance that comes up that pre prevents you from taking action. Uh, but in a one-on-one -on -one environment where you have a coach that really understands your, your business and your specific situation and can really help you find the next best step, uh, that's what our program really offers is it's like the, the super accountability uh, as well as the encouragement to help you, you know, keep your feet moving uh, and really kind of crack the code on what it's going to take to get to that $100,000 per, per month mark or greater. Awesome. So in, in your work with uh, whether it's consultants, coaches, or even service companies for that matter, what are some of the mistakes that you see them making when they're trying to attract and even convert clients? Yeah, that's a great question. The number one mistake that I see service-based business owners making is they don't have absolute clarity on who their ideal target clients are. What they're doing is they're serving everybody and they're offering too much. And this is really what puts them into a place of overwhelm. It's what puts them into a place where they're not allowed to focus. And I, I like to look at these types of businesses as like floodlights, you know, like a porch light. And what I want, what I, what we help people do is really turn that floodlight into a laser beam and get really, really focused and specific. And so I don't care if, if you're an established business and you're already doing, you know, 50, 60, 70 K a month, if, if I talk to you and you don't have a very specific answer for who you serve as your ideal target client, I immediately know that there's an, a massive opportunity for us to help you get more focused so that you can serve a more specific demographic. Because the reason why most people make that mistake is it's sort of counterintuitive to the way that you would naturally think about it. You know, your knee-jerk reaction when you start a business is I want to reach as many people as possible so that I can make as much money as possible, make an impact. Um, but in today's marketplace, when you're talking to everybody, you're secretly talking to nobody because it's, there's just too much out there. There's too many people fighting for your attention. So you really need to get down and focus on the one, you know, who is the specific target client, uh, that you want to be hero to, that you're uniquely equipped to serve, that you can actually get results for, and then really build everything around that. You know, when when we look at selling or sales uh, and what we're talking about, do you think there are any tips and tricks that would actually allow you to attract clients towards you than you actually consciously or actively selling? Absolutely. Um, well, first of all, um, it's really helpful when people are coming to you instead of you having to chase them down. You know, in the old world, the, the, the grow your service-based business world 1.0, where it's about you going out and knocking doors or cold calling or sending a million dms on linkedin to try to get somebody to pay attention to you that that's kind of like the old world thinking well in the new world um what you want to do is you want to create goodwill and trust in your marketplace and one of the best ways that you can do that is actually to help people before you ever try to pitch them or sell them anything actually give them information give them frameworks, tools that they can put in place in their business where they will get a result immediately. And then through getting that result, they of course know that you know what you're talking about and that you can actually help them because you've already done that, or you're sort of giving them results in advance of the sale. Uh, and that's by far one of the best ways uh, to really get A, people attracted and coming to you, uh, but then B, when they're coming to you, they're sort of coming in 80% sold, 90% sold. So the quote unquote sale is really easy. You know, it's just taking their payment information because they've already raised their hand and said, I want to talk to you. I want to work with you. I've already got results from you. So I know that I can trust you. And of course I have goodwill with you. 
And then when it comes to, you know, scaling businesses and scaling businesses quickly, what have some of your experiences in the Silicon Valley taught you? Yeah, well, number one is you got to know your numbers. You know, you got to know your numbers uh, inside and out because that's the soft spot. You know, when you're scaling really quickly, that your knee jerk reaction or your natural response is to maybe not pay attention to the data and to just make decisions purely off intuition, you know, and there's nothing wrong with making decisions purely off intuition, but the best decisions are a byproduct of your intuition and your data. So number one is you got to know your numbers. Um, you know, number two is you really have to have clarity on your vision. Where are you going? What, what like, what are you doing uh, with the business and where is it going? Uh, and, and what are the values that you have inside that business? And by values, I mean, like, what do you believe in uh, in terms of how you behave inside and outside of the business, because when you're scaling, you're going to be hiring a lot of people. And if you're unable to articulate the vision and you're unable to articulate the values and you don't know your numbers, you're, even if you hire really smart people, you're going to, you're basically creating a perfect cocktail for chaos. So it starts with knowing your vision, you know, from there, it's really about, do I also have clarity on my core values? Uh, and then from there, the next thing I would recommend is really having clarity on your numbers so that you can hire incredible people. Um, from there, it's about systems and uh, really making sure you have the right systems in place to allow your people to work together effectively. Um, you know, and then from there, sales and marketing. But the the foundation is really like, where are we going? And what's the reason for this business's existence? All the, you know, so that when you hire a lot of people and you start to scale up quickly, that everybody's rowing in the right direction with the right sense of purpose and the right clarity on who the ideal target client is. And you know, the right tools and methods to be able to give them the results that they want. Um, because if you don't do that, then, you know, you're, you're, you're architecting chaos and, you know, people in the marketplace, when they subconsciously see chaos, they run because, you know, people like familiarity and people like uh, familiarity br breeds consistency, consistency breeds trust, trust breeds conversions. And so, you know, when you have chaos, the opposite of all that happens and, you know, you lose trust and you, subconsciously sort of push people away. So if you're going to scale up quickly, that's the, those are some of the areas that I would recommend you look at as a starting point. And then when it comes to goodwill, right? Goodwill with your clients, you know, how do you generate goodwill and how do you ensure that you have repeatable customers as a result of your existing customers? Yeah. I love that question. Um, well, a good example, I'll give myself a, a plug here. If you go to my Instagram, uh, Joe Stolte Live, at Joe Stolte Live, you can see kind of an embodied example of this. Um, what, what I recommend uh, in terms of delivering goodwill and building trust is you build something that we call a client value map. And inside of your client value map, uh, you start by defining what is the painful reality that your ideal target client is in and what's the paradise that they want to get to. And then what are kind of, what's the method you're going to use to get them from, you know, where they are to where they want to be. And then, you know, you can create three to five sort of milestones or guideposts, if you will, on that journey. And each of those milestones becomes a type of content that you can give into the marketplace to get them from where they are closer to where they want to be. And so for us, our client value map is the framework that I listed before, you know, package, we package up your message, attract, we teach you how to put it in the marketplace using tools like a client value map, convert, we teach you how to have a powerful sales conversation, and then transform, we teach you how to turn people into raving fans so that they'll buy more from you. So if you look at my Instagram, a lot of my content uh, is really focused on delivering those exact frameworks, those tools through videos, through carousels, through images, through copy, you know, really helping you figure out exactly what to do. Uh, and and uh, this happens all the time. People will digest the information, uh, they'll get some results, and then they'll immediately reach out and be like, how can I get more? And that's all by design. So, you know, there's a really good, if you go there, that's a good example of how to actually do that. Um, that's the first part of your question. The second part of your question was, you know, how do we really get, get turn people into raving fans? Mm -hmm. How do we get referrals? One thing I learned uh, in the Silicon Valley world, you think about product development, um, there's, there's this idea of getting someone to their aha moment or what we'll call for the first value moment where you really get that first big moment of value. Um, you know, so for example, uh, like Facebook, I think it was like uh, 10 friends in five days or something like that. I forget the exact metrics, but if, you know, if you've got a certain number of friends connected to you in a certain number of days, you were gonna get an aha moment that would make you addicted to Facebook forever. If you use the messaging platform Slack, 
their time to first value is they know if they can get you to send, I think it's like a thousand messages, then you're going to be hooked on Slack because you will have used the product long enough to have your aha moment. Well, you want the same thing in your service-based business. You want to understand from the minute, the second somebody enrolls, what is the experience that you're taking them on so they can have their moment of first value and really go, wow, I can't believe I didn't get this sooner. And I really really getting the value out of this. Well, if you've got your first value mapped really tightly and you know what that is, you can strategically place requests for referrals at peak points of the experience for your client that are really going to maximize their likelihood of actually referring people to you. Also, by mapping first value, you know, you, that makes sure that you're really focused on getting your client a result. Because at the end of the day, you want to get them the results that you promised. You want to get them from where they are to where they want to be. And so if you do that, and you do it well, right off the bat, people are going to be more likely to refer on their own. But if you strategically sort of systemize asking for referrals on top of that, that's when these things really start to work together and you know really turns into the snowball effect where people start to refer and then their referrals start to refer. And you know really, you can grow your business really quickly uh, without spending any money on advertising um, and without really dealing with like confusing technology like funnels or email autoresponders or all these things. Awesome. So where do people find you, you know, if they want to look you up or your programs? Yeah, a couple of places. You can, uh, of course, find me at Instagram, you know, at Joe Stolte Live. That's like my preferred social media channel. Um, you can also find me on my website, joestolte.com. And, uh, you know, if what we've been talking about in terms of these tools, these frameworks, and these ideas resonate, uh, then, of course, you can go to tractionologybook.com and, and get the book for free. You know, you just got to pay for shipping and we'll get a copy of that shipped right out to you. Awesome. Well, Joe, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your story and, uh, you know, keep doing the great work that you're doing, helping out people with through your experiences and expertise. Before you leave, one takeaway for the listeners, anything that you'd like to share? Absolutely. Um, I mentioned this in the book, but it's something worth mentioning to everybody. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a hard truth, which is, you know, people don't care what you have the capability to do, they care what you have the courage to actually do. So people don't actually care about your capabilities, they care about your courage to take action, right? Uh, so if you're sitting here listening to this and you're thinking, uh, wow, I might have some natural talents or I'm, I'm good at something, um, that's amazing. That's all gonna go to waste if you don't take action, if you don't have the courage to act and actually deploy that into the marketplace, uh, to go out and pursue your dream, to go out and take the action towards the thing that you want. So if you take nothing from this, from this podcast, you know, please take that because that one thing, you know, having the courage to act on what you're already good at is going to take you a lot farther than you otherwise would if you weren't having the courage to act. Sure it is. Thank you so much, Joe. It's been a pleasure yeah. hosting you and uh, wish you the very best. Thank you so much for having me.